Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. We're just going to give a minute as people trickle in. But my name is Madeline Rosenberg, and I'm the Public Humanities Specialist at the Princeton Public Library. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, it's my pleasure to host tonight's program. And I also wanted to note that this program is being presented in partnership with Princeton University Press and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So tonight we will hear from Jacob M. Grumbach in conversation with Kareem M. McConaughey about his new book, Laboratories Against Democracy, How National Parties Transform State Politics. Following a conversation between the speakers, we will reserve about 15 minutes for audience Q&A and the program will last all in total about one hour. So Jacob M. Grumbach is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington and a faculty associate with the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. Grumbach's research focuses broadly on the political economy of the United States with an emphasis on public policy, racial and economic inequality, American federalism, and statistical methods. His research has appeared or is forthcoming in the American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, American Journal of Public Health, Business and Politics, Election Law Journal, Journal of Politics, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Perspectives on Politics, and Political Research Quarterly. It's a long and impressive list. Um, previously, Grumbach was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2018. Uh, Corrine M. McConaughey, PhD, is a research scholar and lecturer in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Her research engages questions of whether and how American democracy depends on its institutional arrangements and the actions of those historically excluded from it. She's the author of the book, The Women's Suffrage Movement in America, A Reassessment, an in-depth account of the politics of women's voting rights in the US. She has published broadly on American politics in both academic and public outlets, including as a regular contributor to the Washington Post and has provided expert commentary on politics for a range of media, including PBS, The New York Times, CNN, NPR, and Vox. So I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items before turning things over to our speakers tonight. Um, we recommend using the Zoom app for this event rather than operating from your browser. Both are fine, but you might have a, a slightly better experience using Zoom in its app form. Please note that this event is being recorded and our recordings of our programs typically go on our YouTube channel a few weeks within the uh, date of the event. Um, we can, uh, and I will do this shortly, uh, enable live transcription for this event. So my uh, apologies for not putting it on early, uh, previously, but I'll put that on as soon as I can, um, if I can get it to work. Um, and if you have comments during the program, please enter them in the chat box. If you have questions for the speakers, please enter it in the Q&A box. It just helps us pick out which are actually the questions rather than putting them in the comments box um, during the program. For those of you who are on your phone, the Q&A function um, may be at the top right corner of your screen rather than at the bar on the bottom of your screen. Um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Corrine McConaughey. So thank you so much. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you, Jake, for being here with the uh, for this uh, conversation today. Um, I um, read the book. It's in the back here. No, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and and found it read it finished reading it quite recently um, and found it quite engaging. So I encourage everyone in the audience who hasn't um, picked it up yet that it indeed is worth um, the time of a read and it's um, an easily digestible read um, at that. So I want to start with the basic um, starting place that the of the book, which is the book starts with a kind of non-controversial observation, right? That the US national policymaking process has been increasingly marked by partisan gridlock and that this gridlock might make the pursuit of policy goals um, shift to the, state, to the states is a pretty sensible step from that starting place. But then you take us a little bit further um, and that's the important sort of big next step to the idea that the policymaking processes that have unfolded um, have been not simply um, those done by, um, carried on by disparate activist groups or interest seeking state houses where their causes might resonate, but this sort of nationally partisan coordinated groups um, and organizations that are doing so. So I wanted to start with 
you talking us through that distinction yeah. that you make um, to sort of solidify, well, what is that next step that you're taking there? And like, what's the importance of it? And um, where does it lead us? Thanks so much. Uh, no, I think that was a really uh, a great summary of that, uh, sort of the main argument of the book. And I want to uh, thank you, Professor Mark McConaughey, for uh, moderating this and uh, the sponsors and all the work behind the scenes uh, to go into this webinar. Uh, uh, really happy to be here. Um, so uh, uh, as you mentioned, so the first step is that, yes, so federalism has traditionally uh, operated as a potential safety valve when there's gridlock in Congress or you know conflict between the branches of the national government, policymaking activity can go to the states um, and uh, that can uh, produce some policy change while the national government is gridlocked. That's an ongoing sort of uh, pattern in American politics. But what's kind of unique about this era is that political conflict, whether it's at the mass level, how voters understand their place in the country and what they're battling over, in terms of organizations and organizational orientations that sort of organize activist groups or big business or labor unions or whatnot, as well as the parties themselves and their network of groups and activists within the Democratic and Republican Party, they're increasingly national, national in orientation, they have national goals. And those national goals and that national conflict is playing out through these subnational institutions. So to take a step back for context, so U.S. federalism, federalism means there's a multi-level system of government where there's a national government as well as a lower level of government in the U.S. case, the states. And really uniquely, the U.S. system of federalism is especially decentralized, even compared to other federal systems around the world like India, Mexico, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, right? They all have, you know, federalism and decentralization, but the U.S., has a couple of unique features right now. One is that it's heavily decentralized. There's more authority at the lower level, especially over democratic institutions. And we'll talk about that later. So election administration and districting and police powers and so forth um, that other, other countries tend to put at the national level. Um, but also that we have these now national parties. So politics is entirely nationalized. Attention and conflict are nationalized. But where policy change can actually take place is at the lower level. And I'm really arguing that that doesn't just shift politics down to the state level in sort of a mirror image transposing the same politics. It really changes the incentives and advantages that different political actors and groups are facing. Right, yeah. So in, in doing so, you introduce this for, for your for your book's case, this this important set of of actors in this story, this nationalized connection um, story, this particular version of federalism that you claim that you're illustrating for us and explaining. Um, so I wanted you to help me understand these yeah. key actors that you introduce, and you call them in the book interest group activists. That gets shorthanded to IGAs. If yeah. any of us drops IGAs, that's what everybody knows. That's what uh, the acronym is. Um, so, can we talk about who are yeah. who are interest group activists, IGAs, um, and and why they matter in this story that you just the overarching structure you just laid out? Yeah. So I'm I'm sort of standing on the shoulders of giants in some ways of adding to a uh, you know broader set of research that's focused on the nationalization of the parties in the U.S. Right. So. Uh, great work by all types of scholars. So I really like, of course, uh, uh, there's work on sort of public opinion and uh, voters and how they are sort of nationally oriented at this point. So uh, work by people like Dan Hopkins in the increasingly United States shows that voters aren't paying as much attention in part because media now is national in terms of internet and cable news rather than state and local newspapers that focused on state and local affairs. So voters. And then I think even more importantly than that, you get a set of actors that people like uh, Alex Hertel Fernandez and Theda Scotchpole have focused on, which is sort of the super elite groups, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which passes around model bills to sort of unprofessionalized state legislatures. And uh, that's, you know, helped uh, produce the wave of, for example, stand your ground gun laws in conservative states and deregulation of uh, you know, extractive industry and all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, waves of state level policy that have swept 
for example, the Midwest as they became Republican in the 2010s. Um, so there's this sort of super elite set of groups, there's ordinary voters, but then I'm focusing on there's this sort of middle group that's very elite too. They donate money to politicians. Um, but one important thing uh, is that these activists are organized by groups and, you know, uh, Kareen's work also speaks to, you know, activists and their organizational structure with respect to democracy, for example, in the, um, in the era of uh, women's suffrage uh, in the early 20th century. But these groups, it's really crucial that these individual activists are organized by groups. So uh, since the 1970s, you've seen the rise of national activist groups, the rise of on the right, for example, uh, the organization of uh, gun rights activists through the NRA and uh, the sort of uh, right to life and conservative evangelical movements with respect to reproductive rights and abortion that we've seen, you know, have been highly successful over the past uh, generation or two. It's really important that these groups are coordinated. These individuals are, you know, not just a lone person who really likes guns or, you know, on the left, a lone climate change activist. They're affiliated with national groups that they donate to and are members of. And also those national groups help to inform these activists of how to get involved in state and local politics where they don't tend to have much information. So how to, you know, I'm a PhD in political science. I have a hard time voting in state legislative primaries, right? I have to read a lot. I don't really know, you know, for state Senate in my district, you know, I moved only a few years ago. It's hard to know like which of the same party to, you know, support the issues I care about. And groups like the NRA or, you know, uh, groups like uh, uh, moveon.org in the early 2000s really innovated with the use of, for example, the internet to say, okay, here are some endorsement lists and for example, state and local primaries and also donate to us and we'll fight nationally as well as in, you know, state and local politics for a particular issue. Um, so that had a real coordinating uh, sort of mechanism and trend for the parties and helped bring state and local politics into the same sort of arena of national politics. So now, you know, there's a bunch of other forces, like I mentioned, the nationalization of media that contributed to this. But I think this is a really important thing where now uh, we see state level politics. Like if you want to understand state level politics, you have to think about national issues and you have to think about does this state legislative candidate do they what do they think about this controversy over disney world in another state or critical you know battles over critical race theory you know going on nationally or whatnot right um or whether the 2020 election was stolen these things are now you know highly uh determinate of how people vote in state and local politics and how uh, politicians act um and that's in part because they're really coordinated nationally by groups um, so anyways, that's adding another layer of who nationalized American politics. And what I show statistically is that donations from these interest group activists are especially influential in what state legislators do in office and how they vote, how uh, they're organized with their overall national party, much more important than a donation from a, you know, some an atomized individual who's not connected to groups, uh, and more important than sort of often the public opinion within a district. Yeah, so one of the things that, that you show us is that, that these actors, in fact, may regularly funnel their money to both of these places, right? That there's this interconnection of uh, in person and in money flows, right? Um, so yeah, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that piece in particular, yeah. because I thought that was a um, a rather unique and insightful observation um, made in the book about like th there is something particular to this set of actors about the, the ways in, that you can see the connections. Yeah, well, thanks so much for that. It means a lot coming from you who like has thought about, uh, you know, individuals embedded within organizations. So uh, usually, and so, I mean, we have to do a little backdrop of like what Americanist poli sci does routinely, especially in statistical empirical work. So uh, you can see this through the study of money and politics, for example, over the long term, where there's a series of debates uh, over time, like whether money and politics matters in the first place. And then another debate about individual donors versus like corporate 
and labor union and you know PAC group donors are now post Citizens United super PACs, you know, sponsored by you know rogue billionaires or whatnot. But there's these individual atomized donors, right, that tend to vote, you know, donate across the country to somebody of their party that inspires them, or like you know, I found in other work on uh, studying. Uh, race and ethnicity in campaign finance, that individuals do care often about descriptive representation that individuals, uh, you know, Black or Latino individuals or Asian Americans tend to uh, donate a bit more to all else equal to somebody, a candidate of their racial group or by age, I imagine that, you know, I'm an elder millennial, I get inspired by these new millennial politicians, maybe send them 20 bucks. But like, this is sort of separate. Uh, that's a highly individualized way of looking at those individual donors as some, you know, there's some huge firewall between them and these groups like businesses or the National Resource Defense Council or, you know, uh, focus on the family or one of these groups. But what it turns out is groups are, you know, networks of individuals like and what that means is we can, you know, in fix my internet really quick. Okay. I'm um, sorry about that. Um, connection stabilized. Um, but uh, really this is, uh, these groups are not so separate. So individual, I tried to track individuals who are donating, for example, to the NRA nationally, like you said, and also to state level politicians. And those people are especially influential, I think for a number of reasons. One is this information they get from the group on how to act in state and local politics to facilitate the movement. Um, you know, the NRA has, for example, like a little app on its website where you can find, you know, informate a script on how to call your state legislator and what to say, right? And then there's also a, a sort of uh, influence uh, uh, sort of advantage where uh, you have these informational tools and you have your group at your back and can say, I'm a member of this broader movement or group. And I think that's especially influential in state level politics. And the big backdrop here is that state legislatures are historically very, are sort of, you know, it's not an insult to say this, amateurish compared to Congress. So they have few legislative resources. They don't have staff lawyers to help them draft bills. They're often part-time and go back state legislators go back to their job on the, at, uh, you know, their job at a firm somewhere and then go for maybe, you know, 30 days to the legislature. The combination of those super elite groups like the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC and model bills or individuals lobbying, right? You know, somebody who's an environmentalist coming and say like, I know about this issue. Like I'm part of this group. I'm going to lobby this politician. And that really, there's a lot of bang for your buck at the state and local level compared to in national politics. So ultimately what you um, help us understand then as outcomes of interest of this process that's unfolding here is are, are really two distinct outcomes that you say we should pay attention to, right? That are unfolding in the States and that they are the outcomes of increasing policy variation and increasing policy polarization across the state. So the end result of this nationalized process where you can't get anything done at the top, but you still have these nationalized concerns and these networks that are pushing in that way, that the result then is a push uh, the result of this push at the state level are these two outcomes that you show us, this increasing um, policy variation and increasing policy polarization. Yeah. So why don't we talk about what those each are and why they each matter? And um, Absolutely. And, and in the end, I think what you're telling us is these, these are things to pay attention to that help tell us that, in fact, it does increasingly matter where you live to what kind of governance you're, you're getting as an American. Right, absolutely. So uh, this you know, uh, process you described at the beginning of the webinar, so uh, you know, gridlock at the national level, increasing since the 70s, really kicking up in the 90s, 
hard to pass policy if you're somebody who really wants to change the world in some way, you know, in any direction, really hard to do, really costly. You move, shift your site, you sort of fail globally, act locally type of shift. Um, and this produces two, uh, uh, two outcomes. One is policy variation, as you mentioned, and that's just states are more different. The hot state with the highest tax rates, you know, are more different from the states with the lowest tax rates on the wealthy or, uh, you know, uh, marijuana becomes more illegal in some places and slightly more illegal in some places or, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of things. We're seeing this now in terms of abortion policy. Um, uh, that's variance or variation between states. But that doesn't have to map on to partisanship of the states, right? It's not necessarily the case. So, for example, during the Jim Crow period, there was less sort of partisan correspondence to, you know, there's the Northern Civil Rights Labor Democratic Party in like Chicago and Detroit and New York, and then there's the Southern Dixiecrats. So you couldn't tell as much. There's a lot of policy variation in Jim Crow, right? Some states fully disenfranchised Black people have, you know, segregated public institutions, all this. Um, others don't. And, but uh, they're both Democratic states, right? Uh, whereas now it's both high variation, not Jim Crow, level, I want to say, like, it's important context. Interstate differences now are very, very big and very meaningful. And threats to democracy are very big and meaningful. But we have to be real about like pre-1965, you know, US, like where there's bigger variation and much more, you know, problems of democracy. But still, like it's meaningful differences now, but it also maps completely onto partisanship. So now you can tell somebody the laws somebody lives under much more based on the party that controls their state government. So that's really important. And so what you're seeing is a divergence between red and blue states on all sorts of policy issue areas, you know, abortion rights, environmental policy and climate, uh, taxation, labor relations, uh, to some extent, sort of civil rights uh, based policy, now voting rights um, and election administration and the fairness of districting. Uh, all these type of things, you don't see as much variation in uh, in issues of policing and education, and especially not uh, issues of policing and incarceration, which uh, uh, we can potentially talk about how, why that sort of bipartisan, the tough on crime wave of the 70s and uh, the 90s was more bipartisan than we might have expected. But uh, the rest, you see this big divergence. So now, the state you live in is much more related to the tax rates you pay, whether you can get a legal abortion, whether uh, you're allowed to emit, you know, various forms of pollution or the ability to get, uh, you know, clean energy. Uh, all of these things are now more determined by your state of residence than they were in the 1970s. And that's due to a combination of states being really active and the national government not being as active, whereas in the New Deal through the civil rights era, through the sort of increases of regulation in the 70s, you saw the national government set floors across all sorts of policy areas. So now there's social security. So it's not like patchwork, old age insurance systems, state by state. You create a national minimum wage that's at a high level. So there's not as much variation across states. You know, Roe v. Wade legalizes abortion nationally in 1973. Uh, all of those reduced interstate variation, but now we've seen the real reverse over the past 50 years, especially the last sort of 20, 30 years. So as you just alluded to, you, you show in the book quite a, a broad array of policies where we can, we can observe right along with you this, this increasing both variation and polarization. The visualizations are really good in the book, oh, so nice, I'll, nice. I'll um, nudge on, take a look at the book um, itself, um, since we can't throw those up on the screen at the moment. But um, so when I say you show, you really do show, right? You illustrate these um, uh, patterns pretty clearly, but then you you do show this 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 divergence from from this from this broad pattern across this, um, you know, this really broad range of kinds of policies. And then we look at criminal justice, as you just said, policing and criminal justice, and, and these things are not like the others, right? right? Like the, the, this, the graphs don't do the same diverging right. and, um, uh, it, and it's just really not hard to see 
Um, and so with that striking of a difference, like what do we what do we pause and take in there? So yeah, thanks. I think this is like if there's any like grad students watching, like I think one of the most important puzzles like in American politics right now that we need hot new dissertations on is this puzzle of sort of non-polarization on criminal justice issues and the fact that uh you know over you know just in recent years but over longer periods of times too all sorts of political inputs in a democracy right public opinion changes voting changes uh media coverage and the tenor social movements change we see you know the 2014 initiation of Black Lives Matter, then a huge wave after the George, George Floyd murder in 2020, probably the maybe the largest scale peaceful protest movement in American history. Then you see a backlash to it after it, you know? all That's huge ebbs and flows and shifts in political inputs, but you see criminal justice and policing policy just doesn't change much. Like it was ratcheted up in a national process from the 70s through 90s in the tough on crime and mass incarceration buildup era and then now you don't see much ability to roll it back. And there's different theories of that. So I have some, I do a little bit of theorizing in the book of why that may be the case. But I think, again, it's like a huge opening for grad students, uh, social scientists, others. Um, and, you know, other disciplines like history have really, uh, you know, people like Elizabeth Hinton and history and things have really done some great work on this as well. But I would say I used to think, okay, it may be that, you know, Democratic state and local candidates who run on policing or carceral reform don't actually want to do that. And it's kind of a messaging. That was like an initial theory of, OK, all these reform minded Democrats come in, but they don't really want to reform it when the rubber meets the road. But then more recently, I think we've seen a, a number of important cases at the state and local level where it seems like reformist candidates uh, and incumbents do really want to change policing and incarceration and criminal justice policy in their areas, but don't really have the institutional capacity to do so. And I think that's a somewhat a product of this decentralization of American federalism, where in most countries, in most developed democracies, you have a national hierarchy of police forces that's more like the military in the U.S., and you have incarceration more nationally administrated, uh, administered. So I think it's a thing where, for example, I think the New York City local government does not have the capacity to, uh, you know, reform a, the NYPD, which has a separate sphere of institutional power on its own that has many tools to resist institutional reforms through democracy. Um, I'm interested in pursuing more work on sort of why police departments are institutionally insulated from democratic inputs like that. Um, and then also in the, um, you know, in mass incarceration, to the extent we're seeing decarceration now, it's much more bipartisan than I think we uh, expected. Um, some extent, there's some like true believer libertarian uh, uh, center right and kind of far right, like decarceration involvement. That's interesting. Like, I think there's more to be understood with that. But also just uh, you're seeing nationally uh, the trend, uh, sort of in mass incarceration is much and sort of incarceration rates are much more determined by the demographics uh uh of a state than by its partisan control but again i think huge puzzles here but uh we're seeing kind of a flip side of so abortion policy is a kind of uh mirror yin yang version where public opinion and political inputs have actually been pretty stable 61 percent support for legal abortion forever you know, and the group coalitions, you know, there's been the sort of evangelical anti, you know, anti-abortion scene. There's been, you know, key Planned Parenthood and reproductive rights activists and the women's movement so much. It's been pretty stable politics for a generation. And then you see this massive, like, political investments really paying off in the Dobbs decision uh, and uh, some states pursuing full uh, bans on abortion in really unprecedented ways. And that's kind of the, you see huge policy change without much change to political inputs, whereas in incarceration, you see massive fluctuation in political inputs, but not much change in policy. Yeah, it, I think these observations are, you know, really important pieces of the particular take on federalism that, that, you're, that you're offering your reader. And I think ultimately, um, 
I think it's fair if I say you're a little, a bit, uh, you're a pessimist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, on, on um, federalism. I, I read you as ultimately arguing, you know, that, that federalism and, and, and yeah, we can talk a little bit more, I, I think, um, even still here about the particular brand of federalism right. that, um, right. that the U.S. has, you know, there's, you know, welcome to our field where those of us who study American politics are often deemed a bit parochial and like we believe in American exceptionalism. And then sometimes we say, but no, but really, <laughs> the U.S. really does have this really unique <laughs> set of institutions. Um, and, and I think the, the particular brand of, of federalism, I, I think it's probably um, fair to say that you and I as, as scholars um, agree on that um, piece that, that, um, that, that federalism matters and then that the particular version of it that the US has is, is unique and, and it probably is really worth our time to, to understand what those exceptional pieces um, really do. So I read you at the end of the day of, you know, some of this is not, you know, just, which is to say some of this pessimism is not just you out in left field by, by yourself, um, uh, right? Ultimately having an argument, um, you know, that builds on, on previous work on, you know, well, well exit options, you right, know, like right. federalism can be a problem because, you know, um, those who have lots of, of resources and a, a capacity to coordinate those resources, well, they can just move themselves a, across this checkerboard, um, and and those interests in U.S. democracy who don't can't right. And so right. there's both the idea that so hey, eh, there's a market or right a, a checkerboard out there that you can move around. Well, but maybe some interests, maybe there's really good reason to believe some interests can do that and some can't. Yeah. Um, and you know if we if we care about democracy in the sense that we care about how ordinary citizens. Um, have their interests represented, then maybe that's a, a strike on the on the federalism pessimism um, side. So you can talk about um, exit options and venue shopping right. too, um, uh, which again is a um, a previous critique that you elaborate on um, right. in the book, right? Like again, the the idea that you know, hey, you, I, I if I'm well organized and well resourced, I can look around and figure out where's the right place and right time to um, push my issue forward. And then I can build momentum from there. And, um, but you know, if, if I'm just ordinary folks in a community and been here generations and we're trying to solve a community problem, <laughs> like I don't have as many venue um, shopping opportunities. Um, and, and well, and if there's gridlock, I can't even sort of try to make a national issue out of my, my local one um, anywhere. And then that's, I think, um, you know, part of your unique critique about exit options and venue shopping is like, so in an era in which, you know, escalating all the way to the top by sort of, you know, trying to grab national headlines of, hey, we're being persecuted over here, that like, where, where's, where's that option even um, anymore? I think that there's a way of thinking about um, your story about the particular era we're in and, and how that has a unique um, you know, sort of further dampening on some, you know, uh, particularly vulnerable, um, and their a capacity to, to venue shop. Yeah. Um, right. And then ultimately the idea of like resources that it takes to, to do all of, of this, um, you know, understanding the whole checkerboard and, um, knowing what its pieces are. Um, and as you were saying earlier, particularly in an age where we have the decline of local, Right. Uh, news, the decline of, you know, your, your um, city, the city newspapers that used to, you know, it used to be a thriving business to set up newspaper shop in the state capital and, and cover what, what, what happened there on the day to day. Um, and, and lucky for those of us who study political history, because there yeah. are reams of evidence in those newspapers about what was happening on the day to day, right? And, um, but pointing out that that is not, right? Okay. That's not the information environment in which um, American citizens find themselves today. So um, federalism, pessimism. <laughs> it's so nicely put, no, you outlined so many crucial uh, sort of pieces of this. Yeah, I would say. So I'm trying to build on what I'd call a sort of critical federalism scholarship. So 
I'd say both in American sort of public sphere and ethos of politically interested people, people who are, you know, lawyers and judges, uh, you know, uh, our eighth grade, you know, AP US history vibes and all types of things. I would end social science as well, like especially political and post-war political economy and uh, institutional political science in the latter half of the 20th century. Like federalism and decentralization is, as a sort of, I guess we should de like distinguish here. So you first mentioned how unique American federalism is because it interacts with the separation of powers, the, you know, having the Senate be malapportioned, having judicial supremacy in the Supreme Court, the electoral, there's so many other quirks about it. It's really hard to generalize. I'm totally with you on that. Um, but in addition, I think in the US, we've seen a number of theories of how decentralization is really advantageous. Uh, it allows people to move to the place where they like the laws better. If you don't like that your state's banning abortion, move to one of these more progressive states. No, like it's good, you know, that's a good thing. And then, uh, uh, you know, the venue shopping uh, stuff and the, uh, you know, threat of exit, like if investors threaten to exit, that puts a lot of pressure on state and local governments to perform well and not make the investors mad who are going to leave with tax revenue. And um, there's all sorts of, then learning through laboratories of democracy, another longstanding theory of we have these 50 laboratories that can create cool policy experiments and reject the failed experiments and they don't burn down the whole country. And um, double security is finally another one that goes back to the Federalist Papers of like a tyrant can't capture all these different state administrations the way it could a centralized election administrator the way, you know, many other, most other democracies have sort of centralized districting and electoral administration. And I think all of those in the era of nationalized politics, like don't work anymore. Like that's just the main thing is if they ever were true, there's debates about how, to what extent the factors you just talked about so well, like inequality and in venue shopping and the exit option, that's probably always been uh, somewhat a thing. But then in this moment of nationalized politics, um, these especially don't work. And one example is like the policy learning the Lewis Brandeis Laboratories of Democracy Theory, where you have two national teams with their own interest group and activist and expert communities developing policy. Like Scott Walker's Wisconsin's not gonna look over to blue Minnesota after the financial crisis and say, oh, like the way you changed your tax code, like stopped the exodus of you know public school employees and you did a good job. So like, we should copy that. No, like they're, we're not copying policies across partisanship and for that reason, it's like, you know, states sort of look to co-partisan states and pick out the policies that are more successful than the failed ones, but they're not looking across parties. So it makes the laboratories of democracy mechanism much weaker if existent at all. Um, as you know, along with many of these uh, uh, sort of issues you uh, just mentioned, I think the double security one in the Trump era, we've heard a lot like, you know, Thank God for federalism and decentralization in a time of a would-be autocrat that was described by the Federalist Papers. And, you know, California's election administrators are never going to, like, buckle to Trump's and so forth. But I think that I'm trying to illuminate under huge uncertainty because it's so hard to generalize across institutions, like, huge, huge grain of salt. I'm saying we have to engage with the critical federalism theories and one on the sort of security of democracy idea is that actually decentralization of democratic institutions helps increase the probability that a would-be autocrat takes national power. So certainly when you have a would-be autocrat and national power, you don't want to centralize everything and give it to them. Like that's that's very clear. <laughs> At the same time, over long stretches of time, or just a decade, I think democratic backsliding in states like Wisconsin and North Carolina, like really does facilitate and presage, because again, states administer elections from local dog catcher to US president. And now we even see if this independent state legislature's doctrine of the Supreme Court goes through like some legal experts think it may, a single swing state legislature could throw a presidential election through electoral subversion. That we have to think about how these state level institutions can propel anti-democratic coalitions to national power and not just how once they're in national power, 
they can't capture all these decentralized institutions. So we have to take that seriously among all these other ones you talked about. But in this critical federalism scholarship, just shout out like Jamila Michener, uh, Lisa Miller, um, uh, others, Des King, others, uh, mostly qualitative institutionalists, historical institutionalists have really, uh, I kind of, I don't know, a lot of my career is putting like, Greek letters and equations on uh, great theories that historical institutionalists have developed. And I'll contrast this to early period, earlier periods of American history where decentralization may have really facilitated democratic expansion. And I think, you know, uh, Kareen, your book, like is an example, there's a lot of unique things about this period. I think the focus on like that, uh, the suffrage movement uh, was uh, helped by connections to third parties, for example, in the early 20th century. Like this is, it's, unique and a bit different. And I think that was an era of some national polarization too, not as much on like racial conflict because it was the, uh, you know, post reconstruction long Jim Crow period. But I think uh, it's worth thinking about what's different there about times when parties compete to expand their uh, democracy to new voters and a time like this of two national coalitions where there's clear incentives, especially in one party, to use subnational institutions to increase your advantages through re making democracy less fair, open, accessible, equitable. Yeah, so I think that that's, um, that's a really you know, great set of questions about what, what diverges across the span of, of American history that you know, that gives us times where federalism is it part of the expansion story. Now, of course, we might ask if expansion could have been quicker if we didn't have right. <laughs> um, the version of federalism we have, which Certainly. to be clear is a version, like you're saying, where states are vested with power to decide all the things about how we cast votes, who and how we cast votes, um, with a few cup, you know, with just a couple of explicit prohibitions about these specific criteria can't be used to disqualify people from casting a vote. Like other than saying you can't explicitly use race and you can't use sex. Um, and you can't use age across a certain age threshold now, right? But other than those specific characters, that's it, right? right? Like the states get to decide everything else about who gets to cast a vote, when, where, how, um, and they can change that. Some of those pieces really easily and others of them are really hard and, um, right? And so I think that there is, a lot to that uniqueness of um, American federalism in that specific way, right? Like the, the way that federalism is wound into the who, right? right? Which is not just that federalism is policy area, but it's literally about um, who's a citizen, right? Who's an acting citizen, right? Um, and, and part of the electorate, um, even for national, offices um, is very different. I, I want to so give a brutal. plug for yeah. that we're open to um, to to questions um, from from the audience or or comments if you want. We, I'm happy to take comments and also sort of push um, uh, the conversation our, our you know last um, 15 minutes of the conversation in 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 any direction. Um, uh, so questions and comments. And I see smart I see smart attendees in there too. There's some yeah. great <laughs> Um, so please feel free to, um, to, to drop them in for us. So that's my plug at it. And we, we, Jake and I think could talk all day, um, but, but we're absolutely um, open to, um, to, to audience input. Um, yeah. And, and there's a lot of going on in American politics. With the As it turns out. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, I think that's all really, really unique and crucial about American federalism is the democratic institutions being at the state level there. And I think, uh, you know, want to really talk, uh, I, I recently wrote a, a piece for Politico and uh, co-authored a piece with Chris Warshaw in the Washington Post monkey cage on the Dobbs abortion ruling. And there, it's very clear that gerrymandering, again, state level drawing of districts 
really, really matters for whether states are responsive to their public about its abortion policy. So now you have some states where a minority of sort of anti-abortion voters can get the majority of the state legislature due to gerrymandering. Other countries that have proportional representation systems, this would not this would not occur. Um, I see a question from uh, Jared, who's uh, Jared Clemens is a great scholar of. Yeah, so we have a question from um, Jared Clements, who's um, asking um, about um, the right the the issue areas are where there's less variation across the states. Um, are there other issues? So we've mentioned um, education and policing. Um, are are there other issues, or are there? Um, Perhaps a place to push this a little bit further is, you know, you cover a broad range, but also are there other yeah. issues where you feel like we should look here too? Like no, no, no book, how no matter how great it is, can do it all. Um, so I guess both pushing the question, Jared's question about, so is that it in terms of what you found? Um, and then, you know, regardless of what the answer is on that, you know, is what you found say, oh, you better, we ought to look here too. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And since it's uh, Jared Clemens asking this in particular, it inspires me to like think of broad, you know, uh, who his work has pushed me to think bro more broadly. So I'm looking like within things that come on the agenda of US politics, like I'm not zooming out to like, how could we construct a political economy and policy regime that would be, you know, fair, just, equitable, responsive, uh, accountable and all these sorts of things sort of zooming out further. So I think uh, we could talk about bipartisan uh, uh, sort of consensuses that haven't moved with respect to a lot of issues like uh, uh, the sort of issues of the economic system, issues of foreign policy and war, right? Issues of international relations. For a long time, issues of immigration had a sort of business policy centrist consensus mm -hmm. that Donald Trump really dismantled um, and the Tea Party to some extent did as well. But I think that's really important to say is that you're right, like I'm looking within a narrow band of like partisan competition, but we can think more broadly about what, uh, you know, theorists of democracy and justice as well as social movements and activists have pushed for. And there, I think you're right, like there were, I think it's changed, there's been some important differences now, but it's true on some of my other work with Paul Freimer uh, looks at the importance of labor union membership in uh, preventing a sort of resentment based politics among white workers, which has been key to the rising authoritarian movements across the world in the 20th century is like resentment based politics, especially against new immigrants or uh, ethno racial or religious minorities, right, how to avoid that one key is labor union membership and the Democratic Party was not as much of an active destruct sort of destructor of labor unions since the you know it's there uh they were much more prominent uh a generation ago but they definitely did not actively pursue labor policy now the pro act nationally would set again as national policy often does would set a national baseline of sort of labor union organizing rights and would essentially overturn all the right to work laws in the states some of which in the midwest work by Vanessa Williamson and Alex Hertel Fernandez and James Feigenbaum has really shown has been a huge, huge force in moving votes to the Republican Party among especially the white working class. Um, and, you know, many of these national and state level elections would have been different absent those policies. So uh, that's just one, uh, one of many uh, areas if we zoom out. And that's why I think, uh, you know, scholars like Jared Clemens thinking about you know, issues of racial capitalism and political economy more broadly is really important. So you um, you you made a, a plug for political theorists are 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 worth their salt. And so our next question is from someone we know to be a political theorist, and Kevin Elliott's in the chat here with that question, um, asking what you think about the guarantee clause as a basis for federal intervention um, in anti-democratic state politics. So is there? Do, can we talk about do we have a history here and um uh so to the extent we do or don't is there um is i love that, that closed window i love that question and kevin would be a, more of an expert on this than me but i would say uh so 
one key issue here. So constitutional clauses like the guarantee clause like do set boundaries, but we have to think about uh, I think we've really seen over the past decade, decade plus that American politics is much more structured than we thought by norms and interpretations of clauses and rules than by the rules to some extent themselves. And that's a frightening place to be in that this was held by like elite norms of reciprocity and like statesmanship and this stuff. That's a frightening place to be like, wow, this could all really unravel. Um, so I think the non-enforcement of the 14th and 15th Amendments are good examples here of you can have very clear language, uh, 14th Amendment, equality under the law, 15th Amendment, uh, you know, no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. That's all before Jim Crow, you know, and mm -hmm. like the enforcement of the 14th Amendment would make all that, you know, totally unnecessary. So I think the grandfather clause is another like sort of example of this as are other constitutional clauses of like the national government could if it sort of interpreted and the political power was uh you know marshaled in that way but i think the political capacity is limited and i think here we're seeing this in judicial politics very clearly where there's been a side like the democratic party and i think mainstream law you know, going back, it's really nice seeing some judicial politics scholars really focus on this. There's been a sort of mythos of like, you know, this is about, we all believe in like universal principles and there's like a sort of mathematics to this. They're like that things are like a, the rule of law like has is like a machine that, you know, then outputs interpretations that we can all agree on, you know, and it's like a West Wing Aaron Sorkin style of politics. And now it's like, no, this is like, power conflict and one coalition really, really won on the basis of building a political power based movement with respect to abortion policy over the mm -hmm. past generation. So I think that's another example. We're in a frightening like political theory, like frighteningly Carl Schmidian world of politics compared to a, a world of, of universally held elite norms. Mm -hmm. And I think that really presses us to think about, okay, well, what can stop norm erosion, especially when norm erosion, norm erosion being like, okay, the rules are staying the same, but like taking unprecedented elite action. I think like you, the use of partisan gerrymandering is a form of norm erosion or election subversion. A lot of this stuff seems, I'm no big city lawyer, but it seems like kind of legal, like to, you know, and uh, the establishment of what sort of rules could enforce norms. And there, I think we get into questions of like, is it okay to erode norms, to pass rules, to protect other norms, things like that are really important questions for especially the contemporary Democratic Party. But that's a really, really good question. I think it's a, it's a, it, you know, that's a scary moment to see that, you know, norms have eroded uh, to such a point and that there weren't formal rule-based procedural mechanisms to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's what's there's what's written and then there's what what the system can do with what's written right um, in in any moment in time. And I think again that that's a a strength of the case that you make in the book is that there's the rules of this system and then there's how it's functioning under the particular right in this particular era right. of this particular brand of nationalization polarization um of the parties and i think you know to kind of go back to alluding to you know hey if you want to read my book too you can uh, i can't promise it's as easily readable as as jake's and might really have me on that one but if you if you like history too um uh, but I think that that is one of the, you know, the, 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 the key differences here is that uh, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the era in which we're, we're having expansion um, with, with greater regularity, not easy expansion, um, but where we're having, and, and I want to be clear, I think I, I, I think the era I, you know, of my expertise is an era I would call of of dynamics um, more than just expansion across the board, but I but I think this is part of of this important difference is the 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 idea of um, how much 
organizations and activists are tied into these polarized nationalized parties. And so we have polarization, as you alluded, there's polarization. um, And, you know, that, that, you know, that exists in part of this expanding era. Um, But one thing that is um, pretty, pretty actually unique, I argue about the suffrage, the women's suffrage movement is the extent to which it's not, it's, it is, it is deeply committed to never becoming beholden to a particular um, party as an as an activist organization. So there's a resistance, right. um, a, a very hard fought resistance to exactly the dynamic that you point out about activists as enmeshed in the party organization um, structure that I think is is really. Um, um, you know, decidedly different about how things are functioning in this um, particular era, which I think takes us to actually a capacity to talk to these last nice. two questions we have is thinking about comparative or historical examples of nationalizing state and, and regional politics. I, I think we can, you may have your own thoughts about those. And I think, you know, like, I think, yeah, like, I think absolutely you, you know, there super are, and I think answer, part so, of, yeah thinking across the differences of them um, has to do with this, this key observation you're making about like paying attention to the, um, the networks, right? And, and the, it, so as we have nationalizing of, of, of politics, you know, how much of that is just of the elites and how much of that is, right. is of the organizations, the sort of civil society buying into that same structure um, or not. So that could be one thing that we could we could talk about this um, question about historical examples or or other um, comparative examples. Um, and then there's a, a further question here who, that wants so to know very here. specifically what we what, what you would think about like, hey, so here in New Jersey, you know, Phil Phil Murphy, he kind of just kind of barely won. Um, and uh, you know, then there are there are several places, right? There are there are still places that are close. Um, so right. in those close places, um, you know, like, is there a discontinuity? Like, is it right. going to just like flip, you know, is, is there a way that you can take what the, what's in the book and the work that you've done and speak to, like, do we just expect a flip? Is that, is that what happens? That's, you know, no, uh, this is so great. And I think to that first question of other eras, like you answer that really insightfully, um, uh, about the you know early 20th century, I think is a really nice case. Another one is you know the civil rights movement with respect to Jim Crow, which was highly regional in conflict. But like the point of this in like you know old school American politics, E. E. Schatt Snyder about expanding the zone of conflict. I'm butchering that phrase, but it's the expand- scope of conflict. Expand yeah, expanding the scope, the scope of conflict, conflict <laughs> is a crucial thing for. Uh, uh, movements to shift to a venue where they can win. So in this case, like in Jim Crow and in the pre, you know, Civil War U.S., like the North, the the le- the not Jim Crow place and the non-slave states have more people, right? Have often have more members of Congress, uh, things like that. Uh, nationalizing politics in those cases can be really advantageous. Um, and those were uh, really important moments where Jim Crow was high, highly regionalized. Like segregationists were really about protecting segregated institutions, not redistributing land or wealth or public goods uh, to, uh, and really preventing a sort of a civil rights coalition that involved poor whites as well. Like they're all, it was highly regional politics until uh, the civil rights movement like blows it up, you know, and gets it to the, uh, 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 50s and 60s Congress and the Warren Supreme Court and so much more. Um, and then on New Jersey politics, that's such a good question. I would say uh, the fact that New Jersey has a Democratic state legislature here is crucial. So my the statistical analysis really shows the thing, you know, governors, the party really does matter. Governors can veto, right? So a Republican governor with a Democratic legislature would veto a lot of the, the more liberal policies and it would be different, a divided purple state where one branch is in a different party that does is very different than a unified state government but what i really find is the big differences are when the states that have been purple for a long time become unified under control of one party so that's what we saw 
in, for example, the Midwest, I think it's so consequential that, uh, you know, to get a unified Republican government in states like uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, those really, really, really mattered. And then another big backdrop too is the U.S. South, one thing, well, I guess we're finishing sort of, but the U.S. South had democratic state legislatures into the 2000s, like much later than we thought. So that shift to unified Republican governance, like Mississippi and Arkansas, are like democratic state legislatures of old school conservative Democrats, but moving to fully unified Republican really did change policy in those areas too. Okay, so we magically are right at time. <laughs> yes, that was incredible. I don't think that's ever happened before. Um, so thank you for, for a really enriching conversation um, and a wonderful discussion and Q&A with the audience. Thank you to our audience for, for participating um, in this virtual experience and to our fabulous speakers. Um, it was a pleasure to host all of you tonight. Uh, you may see in the chat that I threw a link to a brief anonymous survey about this program. You can participate by following it um, and would be really, really grateful for your feedback. Um, otherwise, you can please feel free to visit the library's website to see other upcoming events that we have, both virtual and in person, and we hope to see all of you soon. Um, so just another huge uh, thank you to our speakers and to our audience, and I, I hope you have a good night. <laughs>